How are you? Hey, I'm great. Howard, how are you? Great. Uh, really nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. I, I had something to share about um, PIMCO, knowing your background. It, oh, you yeah. Know, there, it, one classic thing, you know, I spent 50 years in Southern California and it just Bill Gross, right? And then the follow on Mohammed El Arian and and yeah. That must have been fascinating in times for you there, uh, getting your feet wet at, at PIMCO and going off to Europe. Yeah, it was a, it was definitely a, a different environment. I, I mean, I, I have to be honest, the 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 quality of people were amazing, but it's also pretty high pressure. And you know, yeah. you're like in Newport Beach. There's yeah. the sun, the beach, and then you have this pressure cooker <laughs> in this building. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very stark, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you talk about Southern California. I have a lot of fond memories. I, I'm no longer in California, but um, it, it, it definitely interesting. So uh, uh, I, like you, I think you mentioned in something I saw that you started in engineering. Yes. Yeah, same was, for uh, me. Yeah. I was an electrical engineer and computer science. Uh, oh, okay. Major. Yeah. Where where are you based actually? Uh I, I'm in Asia currently. Um, oh, where? But my residence in the US, I'm in Singapore at the moment. So Got it's, it. it's nighttime, but not a problem. I just adjust okay. my my schedule. But uh my residence is in Arizona. So that's where I've been residing oh. for for a From number a of years. Dry heat to wet heat incredibly oh, wet heat yeah yeah exactly all over asia i supported asia for about 10 years the latter part of my career i retired in 2010 and that's kind of why i started this channel because i was working investments and income and doing all that yeah. and i just sort of i had always been an investor in tech because i worked for 40 years in in high tech and uh so that just was a follow on. And I, I fell in love with Asia also. It's just, you know, so exciting. And yet I, you know, always loved U.S. So right, right. I had one quick question and then we'll we'll jump into, you know, curve and, and my questions and stuff for sure. you. Um, I guess it was more around you mentioned that you went to Asia and you were running for PIMCO, the fixed income. And I had an opportunity, I'll never forget, I'm living in Southern California, you know, living the life of the beach and, you know, high tech and making a good income. And the president of a reasonably smaller software company said, hey, Bruce, I want you, instead of running the U.S., I want you to go over to Europe and run sales for our software division. And I, and I thought about it and thought, he said, oh, you'll love it. I was in France and this. And, and you know, I just said, nah. I, I didn't want to do it. So when you mentioned you were over there for a number of years and you wanted to come back, where were you yeah. based out of when you were in Europe? I was uh, based out of London. Oh, okay. uh, but the business was sort of pan-European. So it was across all 13 kind of EU countries. Yeah. But the main office was in London. And we had another office in Munich that I went to quite a bit because um, PIMCO is owned by... Allianz, which is an insurance oh, yes, company correct. out of Munich, uh, Germany. So I flew back and forth quite a bit, but I, I lived in London. Yeah. Okay. Well, London is really the financial center and kind of, you know, although there are other sector financial yeah. centers, but, you know, with uh, Brussels kind of now with the EU and and some of that kind of stuff. Well, fascinating. I, 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 I did my due diligence on Curve. I'm pretty impressed, to be honest. I knew of you guys, but when I actually dug into it, I said, wow, I, I had kind of gone with one of the high yield, one of your competitors out there. And, and then yeah. I started looking into the sector and I started looking at assets under management. And, you know, of course, we know the Black Rocks and the Fidelities and the Pro Shares and, and all the guys. And, and I really think you guys have a nice, nice fun. So compliments to to where you've gotten to this point. And I'm kind of excited to ask you a lot of questions. OK, great. Fantastic. Love to discuss that. And uh, feel free, um, even outside of this interview, if you have questions about uh, we have quite a few, uh, you know, I, I think just as 
contexts. We launched, we filed for some of these uh, maybe earlier than than competitors. Uh, we we launched okay. a little bit later. So many people are like, "Oh, you just have a competing product," but um, in the next few months, we're starting to launch um, strategies that are very different. So it, those plus the existing ones really is a kind of describes the DNA of, of the firm. So excellent. And I, yeah. Yeah. I kind of did. And, and I know there's cases where you can and can't say things. I kind of did my due diligence. So I was aware of the, at least on the public side of three filings. Right. Yeah. And a couple of them are kind of tax and tax advantaged. And one is 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 a little more tech, I think. But you, you can certainly clarify when we get into that. Why don't you start with telling us a little bit? Because my subscribers, I get hit with questions every day, you know, and I'm out talking primarily about the high yield ones. But, you know, I do asphalt. I do a lot of other SCHD, yeah. a lot of more what I call tame. And I have a discussion a lot of times with ROI, the way they perceive ROI and what I perceive is total return, which I have a quick question. Is yeah. your audience primarily dividend investors or yes. Sorts or option investors? I would say they're both, but I okay. think like for myself, I, I'm a active manager of my own assets. Okay. So I'll give you an example. If I own an income fund, um, let's say I'm in one of yours and you guys are using your synthetic through flex and all of your methods. And I feel like, wow, it's dipped down a little in the market, nothing to do with how you're managing. Yeah. I might go out if there are options on yours and I might sell a put way under the money out further to try and buy that at a super cheap price or I'll keep the premium if it doesn't go off. Now, I don't know if your volume is at a point where there are now options on on your TSLP and, you know, whatever some of your other. Let, let me pull up on my other monitor. Um, I think uh, I don't think there I don't think there the aren't currently. I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. So, but there are many ways, like I tell my audience that people right now to me in one way, the market is NVIDIA, right? That's the talk of the town. I mean, to me, it's kind of the stock market. Being in tech, I look at it and say, well, those margins will get eroded from the hardware at some point and they won't be the darling they are, but they have yeah. a technological lead. And I yeah. always say to people, you can go out to a competitor and you can buy their income fund. But understand that, you know, you need protection. So are you buying a bearish ETF on that same fund? How do you offset that, you know, yeah. that up and down? And I love your approach with the monthly. So let, let's jump into that a little bit and have you share with my audience how you take your approach, because most of them are familiar with a high yield, one of your competitors, and they know right. about synthetics yeah. when I, they don't all, you know, some of them really understand them. Some of them don't. So if you just okay. walk me through a little bit of your methodology to generate the income and yet somewhat maintain your nav, which I, I'm impressed with how you've done that. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, at Curve, uh, what we try to do is really make in institutional grade strategies accessible. And also we think about tax efficiencies in, in these strategies. So our six ex existing yield premium ETFs, we call them, but they're really cover call strategies. Uh, the goal for these particular ETFs uh, are to generate uh, cash flow or dividend income distributions. Uh, from stocks that traditionally doesn't distribute dividend or or very little. Okay. Um, so the way we do that, from more from an institutional perspective, is that uh, we write cover calls that are a bit out of the money. So typically it's five to fifteen percent out of the money. Um, the range is dependent on the volatility of the underlying. Right. You're trying to harvest what the IV is giving you in that sense, whereas an Apple might have a lower one than a te than a Tesla fund. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Um, I mean, one of the things also is we want to write 
the strike of the call uh, so that the probability of it ending up in the money is lower. So where Tesla's volatility is much higher, we need to write it out a little bit further out so we don't end up in the money in, in the calls. Yeah. Excellent. Um, one of the things that I became familiar with that I didn't know, I've been writing options and doing options for 35 years. And when I first saw these funds and I tell my subscribers and people, I said, listen, this is a ship fundamentally from something that was for seven and eight figure private wealth clients, that these kind of management tools were there. And now they're really available to retail. So how you utilize them, you have to remember that these yields can work, but it's only as good as the underlying asset, right? Your exposure is if if Facebook, you know, goes down 40%, you're going to be somewhat protected because you have a little bit of an in stream, I mean, uh, income stream. And so yeah. do you want to talk about that a little bit on the upsides and the downsides and how you guys kind of manage that? I mean, not that you manage it, just what kind of results can people expect? Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, cover call strategies are used since has been used since the 80s by ultra high net worth individuals to generate additional income in the portfolio. Uh, these strategies generally work well in three different environments uh, where the underlying either have a very steady increase. So it you know, if it's progressively going upwards, hopefully that never hits the strike. If it goes sideways or if the stock is falling. And in all these three environments, uh, what you want to do is to fully get the premium of the call is that you the the spot price or the price of the stock doesn't end up uh, higher than the strike of the calls that you're Correct. writing. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting that's happening right now in the market, and I think many of your listeners may know, you know, there's been sort of a slew of cover calls. ETFs that's been coming out of the market. Many, many of them are actually index um, cover call ETFs. Yeah. So they write yeah. cover calls on the NASDAQ 100 or S&P 500. And what we have actually seen in the last, I would say, three, four months is that VIX of the market, which is the volatility of the market, sure. have reached almost four-year low. And so if you're you're right when you're writing cover calls, you're really trying to harvest the volatility premia that's in the market. And if that premia is very low, it's likely that you're not going to get as much of of the uh, a yield from the market. Correct. However, there is a divergence, which is that even though index volatility has been pretty low, single name volatilities have actually been very healthy. Um, and the reason is because um, the index in itself has many different stocks. So there's correlations that reduces the volatility of that basket. So an alternative way of getting some diversification, but still getting the vol premium is to get a basket of single names. Yeah. Uh, Which, to get that. Thank you for that. And one of the things I'm going to, jump this question up. I was going to save it for later, but you sort of led me into the thought process. So you've got six single stock funds today, correct? Yeah. Have you thought about a basket or a fund of funds as some of your competitors have referred theirs? Because to me, that says I can spread my risk over six that you have today, and maybe you add a seventh, right? Is that, that is something you can even say or talk about, or is that? Yes, I can. I can talk a little bit about this. Okay. Uh, we uh, ha that is probably the most consistent question that okay. uh, we get from our investors. Um, the original idea for us to launch the six was that we wanted them to be tools in people's portfolio that they made the decision in terms of what exposure they wanted to be in the right. portfolio. But what we've heard from many is that, you know. They, they maybe want to delegate that decision to the manager. So uh, in a few uh, weeks, uh, hopefully, uh, we are coming out with a new ETF uh, that will uh, take a look at having tech exposures in a basket. Okay. But we wanted to rethink about how to do that. Uh, uh, 
I can go into much more detail when it launches, but we try to answer the well, question. Give me a, a broad sense. Let's say you got sure. six stocks. Would it be a portion of those or would it entail something else that's maybe coming out or, or a mixed? Yeah. It, it is a mix. It would include most likely, depending on market environment, but currently it would include the six that we have, but okay. also other names that okay. is pretty dominant in the market. But we also don't just want to purely have right calls on all of them. Because as I mentioned, cover calls works in certain environments. One environment that it doesn't work well is when the stock price uh, jumps or has a run in a very short period of time. So we're trying to create a strategy where investors might be able to get the best of both worlds. And, and that uh, we'll, we'll be coming out soon in a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. I'd be interested in that strategy because I'll tell you one of the things that I've learned and then I've helped teach some of my subscribers and some of the more experienced investors like myself, we talk about it. And that is the classic, if you choose the income versus the growth, right? So I rarely, I always say income has a place in my portfolio, but not exclusive. Even though I'm retired, I have enough that I don't really need all the income if I put all my assets to work. I still want to have some growth. And I'll even do something like on a Tesla where I'll come in and I see that big moving and say I have an income fund. I'll simply go out and buy a 2x for that for the leverage. But I know that it has rapid decay. So I may only want to hold it for, you know, two weeks or some portion of that impulse wave up. And so there's some things like that that seasoned investors do that are active versus somebody that's truly retired and just pass it. So uh, anything I think the funds can do to help that less option oriented person, maybe they don't even have option privileges in their account and don't want to do their own. So, yeah. And and actually, that was the original design for the existing six yield uh, premium ETFs yeah. that we have, is that many people cannot access uh, uh, options in their portfolio. So we wanted to, and many people can buy ETFs, so we want to give access to that type of strategy. But even there, I, I think you brought up a very interesting point, and, and, and it's part of our design for the ETFs that we have now, is that we do try to balance uh, income with price appreciation. So one of the things that is really important to us, and, and we get feedback from investors, is the reason why many investors have exposures in technology is that there is growth and there is price appreciation in the stock, right? So how do you balance getting some price appreciation and then getting a dividend distribution from a stock that doesn't distribute dividends. So the way we think about this, and I'll use maybe Tesla as an example. Perfect. So current distribution yield or rate for our Tesla cover call ETF is about 25%. But we write the call about 15% out of the money. So what happens, especially at the beginning of July, where Tesla had a very good run, is that we're able to capture that price appreciation of, uh, you know, close to 15% before it caps out on the ca uh, cover call. And then on top of that, you're getting that 25% annualized distribution rate. So you get a little bit best of both worlds that, you know, you, you get the, a, a portion of the run up in stock, as well as the consistent uh, distribution that you get from the ETF. Excellent. And and I think my audience, I, I've done the studying on what you guys are doing, but my audience would like to hear it from you. Touch a little bit on flex and touch a little bit on your choosing a monthly and a quarterly basis for your rolling and for your calls and how the economies of scale come back and keep those those commissions down. And I find that fascinating. I think my audience would like to hear about that. Yeah. So uh, on single name options, particular uh, options, there it comes in two different styles. There's the American style and the European style. Yeah. And the difference is that uh, the, uh, the American style, you can exercise 
um, anytime uh, when it's in the money. Um, and uh, what, what the reason why we use Flex is that the options that we can trade, and generally this is a more professional um, uh, investor type tool, uh, you can customize the option that we use so we can then actually trade with our counterparty a European style option on an individual name so that the the uh, you know the the call is never really triggered w- when it is in the money right the second advantage of using flex options is that even if it's in the money we don't have to deliver the stock we right. can settle the cash so it creates a sort of efficiency in the portfolio management process that reduces um, transaction cost, which actually leads you to, to, to this, the answer to the second question is, in our funds, uh, we roll uh, different options at different times. So we have a synthetic long in the portfolio, which is the uh, long call short put at the same strike. This position, you know, replicates an economic exposure of owning the stock. Correct. We roll that on a quarterly basis. Okay. Uh, and, and the reason why we do it, and then and then on top of it, the cover call we roll on a monthly basis. It's it's technically about five to six week options, and we roll it on a monthly basis. Right. The reason why we roll the synthetic long on a quarterly basis is to reduce the transaction cost. So unlike sure. um, stocks, right, where you can hold it potentially perpetually without buying and selling options is a finite life instrument. And you have to, to keep the same exposure, you have to keep rolling or buying a new exposure. So one of the things that many investment strategies, you might not be able to control the outcome of, of the strategy, but the one thing you can control is to reduce the cost, the trading cost of that strategy. So to reduce that, we roll the synthetic long on a quarterly basis, so only four times a year uh, to reduce the bid-ass buy and sell cost. The, the, the cover calls we write on a monthly basis, we do that a monthly because we think that's a sweet spot in getting good premiums to distribute, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, uh, having enough room for the price to increase during a period. I, we think, when we look at historically, uh, price runs and reversions generally uh, is a longer dated period. Uh, monthly seems like a sweet spot so that there's a higher percentage chance that um, that call option would expire out of the money. I, I like it in the sense of, in my <clears throat> estimation, when I look at two different styles, I look at competitors that do it weekly. I mean, personally, daily, I... I just couldn't imagine the administrative costs for zero DTE and that kind of stuff just must be through the roof. So I I don't like that personally. Weekly, it's okay, but it doesn't give you, you get maybe more premium if it's a slow rise, but when it really rises, you can really get, get capped in that situation. So I liked your analogy. I listened to one, and I think you need to tell my audience this, so I'm going to prompt you for it, is you only have to be right 12 times instead of 52. So maybe you can take that for my audience. They may not know what I mean when I say it. Yeah. So one of the dials that you can adjust as a cover call, uh, managing a cover call strategies is obviously uh, how what's the expiry of the option? So you, like you mentioned, there you could write a weekly cover call or a monthly cover call. You can even go a year or longer than a year. Sure. There's certain advantages to that um, because when it's more than a year, it becomes long-term capital gains for US right. investors. But in most cases, you look, you're look you looking at weekly or monthly. Now, when you write weekly calls, you could potentially get a higher yield because you can write that call 52 times a year, right? There's 52 times, 52 Correct. weeks in a year. But if you're trying to coin, if you're trying to flip a coin and you're trying to always get heads 52 times, <laughs> the probability of that happening is almost zero. Right. Versus you have a non trivia, non zero uh, probability if you write a monthly call and write that 12 times a, a, a year. 
Um, so, you know, it, 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 it depends on what your uh, investment styles are. We think that the monthly call is more stable. And typically, as you know, we go back to why we did this is that, you know, the institutional grade um, uh, style of cover calls tend to be a little bit slower turnover and it's more the, it's more predictable and has a you know more consistent uh, premium distribution excellent and also maybe you want to share about your sub advisor as opposed to you yourselves and your people doing the options like some of the other funds you choose a firm that handles that and then you talk with them, maybe you can explain, do you tell them kind of your limits and your per, your prospectus and then they execute sort of your plan with their options capability? Yes, so NEOS uh, Investment Management uh, is uh, our sub-advisor for the fund. Um, and we work with them because they are uh, they do trade a lot of options. And as I mentioned before, uh, one of the things that you want to always decrease is to decrease trading cost. And so by aggregating and, and working with somebody who is already trading with a lot of options, we're able to decrease trading costs within the fund. And that basically is passed on to investors in the form of performance. So slippage to you know what what you would expect um, in, in, in the in the fund performance. I know one question I had that I, I didn't put on my list, but it popped up. One of the things that I noticed, because what I do for my subscribers and people is I actually show them the trades that are done after the day. And I talk about, and some of the funds are weekly, some of them are monthly. And I'll say, okay, they put on these trades. And then always when money flows in, if people are buying into the fund, then they utilize that money to put additional trades in. Do you guys tend to say you wrote so many contracts on calls for your, it's a covered call strategy, but I've always yeah. hated that word covered call because you don't own the underlying if you're utilizing a synthetic mimic, right? Of long stock, but I get that it's sort of covering that strategy. So yeah. do you add additional contracts as you get money flowing in, if you get money flowing in? If we get money flowing in, we generally will buy uh, more contracts of the existing uh, positions. Right. Uh, largely is because um, mm -hmm. when the flow comes in, um, you, you again, nobody really has a crystal ball about where the stock price is going to go. Correct. So um, what happens is... If if you buy the the same contract and it's in the money, you actually get more premium, and if it falls, you kind of collect more of that. Sure. So the the adjustment is, uh, I guess, you're sort of also guessing where the market would go. And I think uh, we 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 stick with what we have uh, rebalanced on a monthly basis. I got you. Okay. Because, I, I, you know, watching these sometimes, especially on the weekly calls, I'll watch a fund manager and I'll see that, say they've harvested 90% in the first four days of a weekly call they've written. I'll see something where maybe they're within 5% of capturing 100% and they won't close it out on that Thursday. And then Friday that high tech volatile takes off and they end up having to lose twice what they collected in premium already. And I think to myself, why didn't they just take it off the table? They had 92 or 94% of the premium harvested in four days, right? But I understand yeah. that, you know, for me personally, I wouldn't do that just from if I was doing it. So uh, I, I don't know how you guys really look at that, but I will say that I'm impressed with the NAV reduction compared to competitors who sometimes pay higher yields, right? That that trade-off of pulling more than maybe what they really were earning, right, is what can cause the NAV reduction. And maybe you can touch on return of capital. And is that something that you do at the end of the fiscal year, if there's excess capital and that's done to avoid taxes? And and a lot of times people don't understand that, what's taxable and what isn't taxable. Sure. Um, 
So you, you bring up a very interesting feature that we have in all six of our strategies. Um, if you look at uh, the dividend distributions for our funds, it's actually generally pretty stable. Uh, and we do that very intentionally because we know that our investor base, many of them are uh, close to retired or are retired. And so some of them are using these to supplement their income. So they want to have, you know, they, the expectation that the same amount or roughly the same amount is coming to them month over month. Sure. So that's something that we we think we do, we try to do a good job at it. The way we do it is, and and to answer another part of your question is that about nav erosion, is that we only distribute the premium that we get from the market from the cover calls. Okay. We look at we we actually, um, and pretty religiously monitor that premium, and in fact, once we get the premium, we have a bank uh, in the fund that we distribute from. And if one month we get more from the market, we actually bank some of that premium. Uh, Do you keep it in the treasuries or the money market that have the- that are, yeah, We don't yeah. distribute all of it. Right. Uh, and, then, and then if uh, one month we get less, we use the bank. So that allows us to smooth out some of the distribution okay. volatility from our funds. Uh, but there is a limit to that. So even with very um, high volatility underlying like Tesla, you'll see the distribution rate a little bit more volatile. But but I think if you look at the low vol names like uh, Apple or Microsoft or Google, the distribution is should be fairly consistent. Now, going back to the second question that you yeah. have, which is uh, the, the categorization of the distribution. Right. Um, this, I, I think, primarily applies to U.S. investors, though sure. I believe Canadian investors have some similar tax treatment. But in, in the U.S., there are I, three large buckets uh, you know, of, of tax treatments for the income that you get. Uh, most income that you get in the form of dividends or interest payments from a bond are taxed as uh, ordinary income. Sure. And that if... You know, if you're at the highest tax bracket, marginal rate is 37%, right? Uh, the second, which is more advantaged, uh, is that if you hold your uh, holdings uh, for more than a year, but you don't sell it, uh, but this, this does not apply to uh, income that you get, is you get a, a favorable tax treatment called long-term capital gains, sure. which the highest marginal rate is 20%. So you get a 17% treatment uh, savings. But there's a third category called the return of capital. And this is a, a situation in which within a fund, and especially in our strategies, at the end of the year, when you have uh, settled uh, you know, uh, the losses and the gains, and you can, uh, if it's an overage, uh, on top of that distribution, some distribution can be categorized as this return of capital. And it's determined at the end of the fiscal year, uh, uh, December 31st. Is that your fiscal year for you guys? Uh, Is that... it's, it's, it, uh, when I say fiscal, I mean the, the end of the tax year, which you be in December. Yeah. And uh, when it is uh, considered a return of capital, that distribution is not immediately taxable. Right. So, lowers, your, lowers your cost basis when you get your 1099. Correct. It doesn't show as income. It, it offsets that. Yes. It makes actually your long-term capital gain bigger, but that's in advantage tax treatment. So, so that's... if you, correct. So if you hold your um, uh, position, uh, you can uh, potentially, um, obviously, everybody's tax position is different, so you have sure. to consult with your right. advisor. But you uh, can uh, essentially compound uh, the return of capital portion tax deferred until you sell uh, your position. Uh, and so what it's similarly doing is if you have a tax deferred account, um, like a IRA, you're doing it in a taxable account. Sure. 
Yeah, so that's, it, it that's makes a great sense. tax advantage, especially if you are a retiree, right? You want to, um, if you don't use all of the distribution, you can continue to compound um, that, um, uh, um, uh, the distribution until you have to sell, sell the, you know, um, your um, position uh, that uh, also assuming if your ordinary income tax rate is, you know, above 20% or so. Sure. Excellent. Thank you for that. Now I prepared something. I'm kind of, I can talk about this or not. It, it's kind of, if, if you're interested in this, because I cover other funds, I really went out and you overlap with your six with some of the other funds, right? And I did a careful analogy of your fund and a competitor's fund without really saying who that people are going to know it, but it says competitor. And, and I noticed out of six funds you have that you outperformed in three of your single stock ETFs on total return Two, you slightly underperformed them. And then on one, you tied. And I thought it was fascinating. Uh, Google was the one that you really outperformed on. And then also in Tesla. And the other one that you outperformed was Apple. And it's interesting when one looks, so I don't know if you're doing it in your press or you talk to your clients, but a lot of people, I always say to my subscribers, don't chase yield, right? Don't chase yield. Oh, this fund pays 30%. Well, what's the NAV reduction, right? What's the NAV erosion? Right. If you don't have any and you're getting 30 percent and it's tested over time, that's great. But if you're getting 27 percent NAV erosion and you're getting a 30 percent ROI on yield only, your total return is only like three percent. So I was impressed with your stuff. But when people look at this compared to some of the high yields, they go, oh, well, that's kind of tame. So they're over there chasing yields. So I always caution them. But yet at the same time, there are some categories that I see you guys didn't choose to use. And I say you guys, you know, curve. Um, and, and probably understand it. I mean, one of them right away would be Bitcoin. I, I'm not a crypto bull, but I am a BTC bull because I really like and I really like Michael Saylor and some of the things he has to say and what he's done with their treasury, which is kind of counter to anybody in the fixed income world. Right. To, to not yeah. do bonds and that. But I, I really kind of like that. But have you ever thought of that, or is that just something at this point that you probably wouldn't do? You know, it's very interesting you brought this question because over the last three weeks, we actually have been asked by a lot of our investors about this particular sector. Uh, I, I won't say I, I, I won't say that we wouldn't do a product. Okay. We're actually okay. thinking, how can we do something that is a, a bit more interesting, right? I, I think. Um, for individuals, uh, Bitcoin's very attractive because there's very high price actions. Um, but Bitcoin doesn't distribute anything. Uh, but is cover called the right strategy? Because oftentimes the price movement is so sharp that you cap the upside, right? So I, I think in the back, our team in the back of our mind is trying to figure out what is a good design for that strategy in that space. So, you know, I think, I think maybe um, if there, you know, future, we, we could talk about the new products come in, we can talk about how we think about design and we want to um, make a strategy. I think for us is we don't want to create something that is a trade. We right. want to do something that is a strategy. And I think the difference is that a strategy tend to can adjust itself in different market environments. Uh, so, you know, we, we can, um, so in the Bitcoin space to reiterate, we're thinking about how can we navigate, you know, ha the having cycle and sure. not having dividends, having strong price actions and try to include all of that. Uh, so, you know, if we come up with something great, we'll, we'll come back and, <laughs> 
discuss. Well, that. you know, what? I, I'd love to do that. We'll have to we'll have to try to set something up six weeks out or some something. I'll be in communication with you when you guys are further along. I'll say one thing. I'll share with you something that a competitor's done, and sort of an unforeseen circumstance that came up. And so they had a they had several you know funds that were on stocks that were affected by BTC, but they chose one to sort of follow Vanguard, Fidelity, well, not Vanguard, sorry, Fidelity, BlackRock, uh, ProShares, a lot of the guys that just had traditional BTC, you know, strategies. And one of yeah. them was uh, uh, Bitto, which happens to be one that ProShares has on futures. So they use CME futures and so forth. Well, that paid a very small little yield, but it was closely tracking BTC in the market, in the futures market. And all of a sudden, they started upping their yield, which if you then write a covered call with synthetics and you mimic something that has a big payout, it really messes up the logic flow and writing of the calls. And, you know, they do a monthly distribution. So I thought it was like one derivative on top of another derivative. And so there's a, I think your strategy thing is spot on. I, I think if you can come up and really think that through, because there's tons of, I mean, Kathy Wood and, and, and Ark, you know, got out of some of the pro shares and created her own you know, fun yeah. that way. So I, I think there's room for improvement. So I, I'm really excited by you saying that. And it sounds like you're looking to add some others along with this basket opportunity. So I really look sort of forward to what you guys might have. Let me run through my list. So anyway, I may share with you privately this analysis I've done. I'm sure some of you, but I literally took these six funds that you have and I compared it to a competitor. And like I said, you won on three of them. You lost on two by not much. And on one of them, you tied. So I found it. And that's in total return. Right. And many times the yield you were out yielded two times. But when it came back to your nav being strong, you really shine. So again, kudos for that. Um, let me, I'm sure somebody in your company has probably looked at that kind of stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. We thank you for that. I, I think that was the design from the start, which is okay. that uh, we want to have a uh, repeatable and stable distribution. Um, and so what we, guard against is uh, over distribution that may in, eat into the principle of the fund. Be it, you know, that never quite made sense to us why you would give us money to manage and then we just return it back to you yeah. without additional right. um, yield on it. So that that is something is very intentional. And, and I'm glad that um, you've noticed that in the performance. Yeah, I, and I didn't until I really started looking into your funds. Like I said, even though I say don't chase yield, where does my eye go? I said, well, what are they paying, right? Well, once I, mean, I you know, you can give me a hundred dollars and I can give it back to you. And that's like a hundred percent yield. So, you right. know, that, that is something. But then you know, if I'm left with safety. nothing, all you've done is return my hundred dollars. Right? But keep in mind when you give it to me and then uh, if I give it back to you, it might be considered ordinary income. So you actually lose. Yeah, 30 I, I lose. Yeah, like you're, you're, so, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, one thing I do notice that was kind of a bugaboo to me personally was Inflex. Obviously, they're probably using Bloomberg and it's an institutional investor. It's not available to retail. Sometimes they don't even show up on the retail specs when they're inside Flex. And I realize you can customize. Um, is I always notice, I shouldn't say always, but I notice the trades many times, you know, the traditional guy, if I want to put a combo option on that's essentially a, a synthetic long stock myself, and I'm in yeah. retail, I can let it expire worthless, but I also could be assigned. So I understand the protection of flex and European option, right? But yeah. the annoyance, just a little personal thing I observe, sometimes they're buying it back for a nickel when it's way, it, it should really expire worthless. So why don't they just buy it for a penny? It, you know, it's small money. I'm not on, sure. Yeah I, yeah, I don't know about that. 
uh, I'd have to talk to somebody in NEOS or some of the other funds that actually do that. But remember, you were talking about cost. So, you know, you might be $30 away from that really having any value. But I think when you contact them and you say, I want to buy it back, they say, OK, we'll give it to you for two cents. And and they're ending, right, because they don't expire. or They don't get settled in cash until the end of the time. Yeah. So the interesting thing about institutional options trading is that many options don't actually expire. Um, many managers roll before the expiry date. Correct. Um, part of it is that they don't want to deal with expiry uh, or rather delivery. Um, right. So uh, you never get a true kind of ex expired uh, option in, in many I of the you. institutional uh, portfolio. And so basically people just roll their positions um, in, in the in the in the funds. Yeah, it's almost um, closer yeah. to futures. When I think of futures of all, you know, when I've invested in actual futures, you're always, you know, rolling. So Roll, options correct. really are are similar in that regard. Let me see if there's something else in here. So you got you mentioned on the monthly. Let me take Tesla, for example, because I've looked at your competitor and I've looked at you and you've done a better job. And one of the problems I've had, and it's even, I was almost ready to do a, what I call a forensic accounting of Tesla through its cycle. So one of your competitor funds came out and, yeah. and I looked at Tesla and I said, okay, it was trading around $220 when they launched. And, you know, I remember the chart in my mind, you know, it was sub 20 or around $20 in 2019 and Tesla hit a high in 21 of 400. So it had a 20 X run. Then it pulled back to a hundred. Right. So it lost 75 percent from 400 to 100 and now appears to be in an impulse wave that could take it higher again. You know, none of us have a crystal ball to know. But I watched that fund have massive erosion and do a reverse split. And then even though Tesla is higher, they're not even back to equal. So and someone would say, well, OK, I get going down. You're going to you're going to do 90 or 95 percent because at least you're collecting income, whether you're doing weekly calls or whether you're doing monthly calls. Right. Right. But when it turns and goes back up, if you're writing 10 percent out of the money and it's going up 20 percent a week, you're getting killed on, on a weekly. So I caution people to be careful in the super high IV and just literally get some long stock exposure if you're really bullish, get your income. But I like the way you guys do it, but even you can get capped on your monthlies essentially, right? It runs by you. Yeah, so the limit for us is, uh, for Tesla, for example, the 15% out of money is if Tesla had run more than what the strike is over a month right so right. it you know sometimes uh stock behaviors they have a pretty good run in a week and they mean revert and fall for the yeah. remainder so as long as so in in some ways what your the, the adjustment as a cover call strategy is you want to have a long enough window if it mean reverts that if at the end of oh, the month yeah. falls you it's still out of the money but I think the tighter the window, it gives you less room, less room for the Correct. stock. Uh, Correct. So, yeah. So that that is fascinating. And, and I listened to some of your stuff on the monthly and it does make a lot of sense. Um, so the economies of scale is you're writing less options, right? Because you're writing monthlies. Uh, someone is yeah. writing and, weekly. And one thing to mention is also whether it's fair or unfair, Retail option trading is a bit expensive. Um, the bid ask um, could be, you know, from five to fifteen basis points. Okay. Uh, versus, you know, more institutional trading, the cost could be uh, one to five. So it's almost a, a tenth uh, of the cost. So that that also is an advantage in terms of using the fund because we're getting that institutional pricing and, and pass it into into the fund. Um, or it, it shows up in the performance. So we 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 try to 
and I think, you know, the most things with finance is the economy of scales. You you get pricing the larger the order size is and, and the bid ass is tighter, you know, the, the bigger the trades are um in your portfolio. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Like I mentioned that some of the competitors have had their funds for 18 months. So even some of their funds with the synthetic and the covered call strategy, they're now having options appear on their Tesla, you know, their version of Tesla only big. I mean, but look how thinly traded they are compared to the underlying. Right. So, yeah, it's I an mean, option on options. It's yeah. like the second derivative of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's why I was giving that example of having a, a Bitcoin on top of ProShares Bitto, which uses Bitcoin commodities, right? And yeah. the commodities on the CME. So it, it's kind of, let me double check because we're getting into our time. Um, I talked to ROC. Um, so touch on a little bit of what you can say about a potential tax efficient type of fund or more tax efficient can you can you touch on that at all that you may have submitted something but it's not where you can talk about it i'm not sure uh yeah i i uh, i suppose that's part of as i mentioned part of the design of the strategies when okay. we think about uh new strategies that we want to launch is not just it a large part of it is how do we navigate different market environments. But uh, one key component that we also bake into our design is how can we make it more tax efficient? So, you know, our background, many of the teams have worked at a very large investment managers, and there's been a really great, uh, a lot of great institutional strategies that works very well, but they're really extremely tax inefficient. Uh, for example, there are many strategies that uses futures and those are very tax inefficient, uh, but they're okay for institutional investors because they're non-taxable entities, endowments or pension funds. What do you but think as, of, yeah, go ahead, finish, and then I, I'll- but, but as soon as, you know, you want to make these institutional strategies available for advisors, self-directed uh, investors, but as soon as you let taxable entities use that, it becomes extremely not uh uh, tax, it's, it's just not tax efficient. And so we try to think about, okay, how do we take these institutional strategies on top of that, make it more tax efficient so it's more usable for you know, taxable investors? What do you, uh, I was reading, and because I did futures trading for a number of years, I don't do a lot of it now. You know, they have the 1256 where you have mark to market and 6040. Uh, somebody did mention to me that one of your competitor funds um, has, an, it may even be an index, I forget which one of theirs, that utilizes a more tax efficient by having it categorized as the 1256 and and i have to do my research i know the name of the fund but or, or the family i don't know the specific fund that falls into that is that anything that might be in the realm with you guys or yeah so uh, one and uh one strategies that's coming up uh it is something that has been used in institutional space but in a futures version Okay. Uh, it's very tax inefficient, but okay. we managed to figure out a way using options that could be more tax efficient. So that will be coming out. And, and again, that's part of our DNA is like, we know uh, in a way where the bones are buried, right? Like we know <laughs> what good institutional strategies are, but we just want to put another layer of design to make sure that for taxable investors, uh, they get the same benefit without the heavy tax burden. Yeah, I, 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 I get asked that, as you could imagine. I mean, I, I'm no CPA. You know, I always tell people, talk to your tax advisor. But obviously, as someone who's traded for 40 years, you start to learn, you know, things about taxes and, and you know, legal avoidance of taxes. And um, so that certainly plays. I, I look forward to, to seeing what you guys are doing there. I'm looking through my list here. Uh, oh, talk about your fee. So on your website, I see 99, which is 
pretty much on with many of the competitors. And then I see 115, you know, uh, as a percentage. Yeah, when when we filed, um, we as I mentioned, we were actually one of the first to file the existing funds that we have. We launched a little bit later. We didn't quite know what the the fee level would be, what the market accepted. Was. But by the time we were getting closer to approval, we saw what the market pricing is. So we just we just basically provided a free waiver so that the net expense ratio is what the market pricing is. So that's where it okay. ended up with 99 basis. Totally makes sense. I, I Like I said, the more I've discovered about you guys, the more I'm going to go back to my audience and let them know, you know, my assessment of the advantages, right, that, that you do have. Um, so I, I look forward to that. Uh, and thank you for everything you've shared so far. And I'm just going to make sure. So NEOs, are they doing a number of companies? So that's sort of their specialty um, in terms of, or is it NEO? I've said NEOs. Uh, is NEOs. It? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure the other maybe clients that they have. but Yeah, um, I can always go out and look at their, their website uh, on that. And, and so will you do another tech company? You mentioned that, that you may add another tech company. You don't, you know. Uh, we, I don't know if we will do another single name ETF, okay. but we will leverage what we have uh, do you, and uh, do a basket of uh, maybe other names that, that, that is in the market, yeah. Now, does your perspective, some of your competitors – they're not allowed to switch from what I understand. In other words, if they have a single stock and they're doing synthetics and then mm -hmm. they just want to do real covered calls and buy the stock, they're yeah. not allowed to. Is that something in your filing that restricts you from doing that within a fund? That is actually a bit of a difference that we have in our fund. Okay. We can hold a portion of the fund in an underlying stock. And the reason why is also part of the design was that we were afraid what happens if the option market it becomes a little bit funny. So we want to be able to actually uh, be able to access the underlying markets. And also on top of that, uh, you know, synthetic replication comes with its own trade-offs, uh, cost and efficiency. Uh, versus owning the stock. So we want it built in, in our strategy, the flexibility to choose to whether do a portion of it in synthetic long or to actually do the cash long. And we make that decision depending on what the replication costs and the various different factors. So we, we like to build in flexibility in our strategy so that, so you, that get the best execution within the fund. So you might switch within a fund. Let's take your goop or Google? Have you always yeah. done synthetics or there's times you've bought the stock itself? So far, we've only done synthetics, okay. but we can uh, buy the Google stock itself um, if we think that it would be beneficial to the strategy. Okay. Um, I can give you some examples. So for example, sure. doing the synthetic long, you're buying the call and selling the put of the same strike. Cool. Now, the reason you do that is is the the premium you get from selling the put could offset the cost of buying the call, but that may not always be close. And that's what depends is, on also where you know. are in your strike price and how far out. And, but yeah, even right. the market and the IV dictate that to some degree. Right. And so if it becomes the, if the skew is too great or it's no longer advantageous or makes sense, then we would put a portion of the fund to actually just buy the, the stock. So we want that flexibility, right? It's always in the strategies, it's good to have flexibility to get to the same exposure in different ways, right? So I know I've sort of asked this, but one final clarification. So say you've got your monthly strike and say it's 12% out of the money or 10, depends on which stock and the IV. And yeah. you write it and you're halfway through and you're close to the strike halfway through. Now, I it could revert to the mean, like you said, and go down. If you get money in, will you change the the 
a, a strike? Would you maybe say, well, I'm going to write a new strike in addition to my synthetic? It would require I buy a call and sell a put at a different strike, or would I just not do that? Uh, you're referring to the synthetic law. Yeah, I'm referring to and And then you yeah. typically match by selling a covered call in the sense, right? For the synthetic long, we generally will keep the same position, meaning the okay. same strike. Right. Because uh, the, 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 the long call short put is there to get the long exposure. Sure. So uh, economically, it actually wouldn't... Um, Make sense to you. Mostly be different if you had a different strike. There might be some consideration about what the implied financing rate is. And I'm getting really technical. Yeah. No, no, I understand. We, we so far, we so far would stick with the the strike, the same strike of the option at the beginning of the quarter, basically. Do you match your quantity in the covered call strategy that you sell them? You know, so you're doing a quarterly synthetic. Right. You're yeah. going out at some point and you're buying your call and selling your put, same strike, same expiration, out a quarter. Then you do your monthly, your your I call them naked calls because technically you don't really own it, but it's covering the long stock mimic of the yeah. being long. So do you always match the quantity and those calls to the same quantity in your we have the flexibility to adjust the quantity of the cover calls that we write, but so far you uh, haven't chosen to. We haven't. Correct. Okay, and that's what I kind of see out there in the marketplace and the few that are using this. So kind of interesting. Okay, well, hey, I really appreciate your time today, Howard, and and I would like to have a revisit when you have some of these funds that you're launching or are launching. And because I think my audience would really like to hear what you're doing out there. Great. Thank you. I, I'd be glad to come back. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, have a great day. All right. Have a great Bye. day. You Bye. too.